I would like to introduce Dr. Keith Weber, um, who is a professor of mathematics education at Rutgers University. He received his bachelor's, two masters, and his doctorate off of Carnegie Mellon University. He's won several prestigious awards, including the 2006 Early Career Publication Award from the Research and Mathematics Education Special Interest Group of AERA. In 2007, he won an Early Career Award from NSF. He won the Best Paper Award at the 12th Conference on Research and Undergraduate Mathematics Education in 2009, and he won the Annie and John Selden Prize for Research and Undergraduate Mathematics Education from the Mathematical Association of America in 2010, and he received the Rutgers Board of Trustees Award for Excellence in 2012, so not a very busy research or mathematics education. Um, his research in mathematics education focuses on advanced mathematic thinking and students reading and comprehension of proofs. He's particularly interested in how mathematics majors can understand and learn from proofs in their upper level mathematics courses. And his research combines deep mathematical understandings with the tools of cognitive science to analyze and assess the learning and teaching of mathematical proofs. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Hubert. Thank you, Amber, for that introduction. And, uh, Thanks to all of you for inviting me, uh, inviting me to come here and speak. It's a little intimidating before speaking with such a high-powered group, but I'm excited about sharing my ideas with you. Um, the papers that I uh, wrote, um, I'm going to be going through a lot of uh, my career grant, and uh, I've got to give the obligatory thanks to the National Science Foundation for funding this work. And so some of the details are going to be omitted, but if you're interested, uh, send me an email and I can send you the slides. And then our group has a website where you could download all of the papers if you're interested in any of them. I'd like to start my uh, presentation with a thought experiment. So here's a theorem for number theory. n q minus n is divisible by 6 for all natural numbers n. And um, to somebody not familiar with math, this is uh, surprising and interesting. And typically what we do is we present a proof of this in our mathematics lectures. So what I'm showing is typical of what you might see in an introduction to proof course or at the beginning of a number theory course. And the thought experiment I'd like you to think about for a second is why do we show this proof to students? Now the natural answer is we show them this proof so students can be sure that the theorem is true. But if you think about it, that's not a very good answer. First, who really cares if this theorem is true? It's interesting. But to my knowledge, it has no theoretical or practical applications. But second, you don't need to convince the students the theorem is true. The professor said it was a theorem. They already believe that it's true. Uh, nonetheless, I do think there's considerable value of showing this proof. But the value lies within the proof itself. Uh, the philosopher Yehida Rav wrote an influential paper saying that the proofs, not the theorems, are the bearers of mathematical knowledge. So mathematicians learn from reading the proofs, not just the result that was shown. And I want to go over a couple of the things one might get out of this proof. <coughs> one of the things you can get out of this proof is this shows you why the theorem is true. This theorem appears quite surprising until you realize that nq minus n is the product of three integers. And some people attempted to define an explanatory proof as something where there's a characteristic property such that if you change the property, you can get new proofs. And you can do that here. I can use the same proof idea of a change of property to show n cubed plus 3n squared plus 2n is divisible by 6. Or if you prefer a more exotic example, n cubed minus 4n is divisible by 48 for all even numbers n. Another thing that you might get out of this proof is the, I, the theorem itself doesn't really generalize much beyond its original context, but the implicit justifications in the proof do. So the last one in particular, that if two primes divide a number, then the product of those primes divide a number, is a very important fact in number theory. This proof is useful because it shows you how to prove other theorems. If you're given, a, if you look at it more broadly, if you want to show that a number A is always divides in polynomial, you factor the polynomial, you take the prime decomposition of the number A, and then you use modular arithmetic to show that each of the numbers divides one of the terms in the polynomial. And then that's a way that you could use to show a lot of theorems of this type. And finally, to show that this is true, um, this shows that this is true for all numbers n. But um, 
you could use these ideas in the proof to show that for computationally that this works for any number n. The point that I wish to raise here is that you can get all these benefits from the proof, but you wouldn't get them just from a literal reading of the proof. You'd have to mine the proof for those details to understand them. <coughs> and what I want to talk about here is how one can mine the proof for those details. Now, before doing that, I want to go over six points from the literature. So Davis and Hirsch said a typical lecture on advanced mathematics consists entirely of definition, theorem, proof, definition, theorem, proof, and Solomon unrelieved decapitation. <laughs> I actually don't believe this. I think it's more of a funny caricature than an accurate description. But it's certainly the case that a lot of lecture time in advanced mathematics is spent giving proof to students. What, why do we do this? We do this to provide the students with some type of insight and understanding. So some math educators, such as Eric Newth, uh, lament that high school students don't appreciate the role of understanding and insight that proofs can provide. Mathematicians do. If you ask them, they'll tell them that. However, students often don't reap the intended benefits from these proofs. There actually haven't been systematic studies on this that I'm aware of. So in this case, anecdotal evidence will have to do. So Carl, Carl Cowan in the American Mathematical Monthly said, let one of your B students explain the statement and the proof of the theorem from the book. My students do not have the ability to read and understand. The majority seem to simply recite the same words back. We do know that math majors have trouble determining between correct and incorrect arguments. Now, I don't want to say checking for, con checking for correctness is the same as understanding, but if you can't tell if something is correct or not, that does give an indication you're not understanding the arguments fully. Um, proof understanding is often not assessed meaningfully in advanced mathematics courses. So the mathematicians that I spoke with said if they assessed a proof understanding at all, it was to prove a very similar theorem, you know, just by changing a few variables, or simply recalling, asking the students to recall the proof by rote. Uh, math professors regard studying a proof as very time consuming and complex, but they don't put much explicit effort into their teaching and showing students how they should be. Now, the goal that I have for this proof is I want to go over the sources of students' difficulties, effective proofreading strategy that students can do, unproductive beliefs that students hold about proofreading, the importance of proof comprehension assessments. And if I have time, insights gained from the teaching experiments. I made a couple of uh, changes to these slides, which seems not to have uh, gone over when my computer crashed, but I think we'll be OK. If you see anything odd, that's the reason why. So students' difficulties with proof. Um, when I started this project and got the grant, there actually was a basis in the literature, which I was fortunate to have, about why students had trouble with proof. So one reason that students had trouble with proof is they were convinced by empirical evidence or examples, rather than deductive proofs. So since they're not convinced by deductive proofs, they don't pay much attention to them. Uh, students tend to focus on the appearance of a proof, it's like does it have symbols or is it in a two-column format, rather than its content. Students use idiosyncratic or random processes for checking the validity of a proof, and uh, thus they perform at chance level, to use Selden and Selden's phrase. And one of these things is whether they understand the proof, if they don't understand it or it's not familiar to them, it's not a proof. Um, the drawback to this literature is I think at least with regard to mathematics majors, all of these things are wrong. So what I had done is I asked 28 math majors who had just complete, successfully completed a transition to proof course. And they were asked to think aloud while evaluating the correctness of 10 mathematical arguments. So after reading each argument, they were asked to make the following judgments. Do you think the argument is valid or invalid? On a scale of 1 through 5, how well do you feel you understood the argument, or 5 is you understood the argument completely? On a scale of 1 through 5, how convincing do you find the argument, or 5 is completely convincing? And if they gave less than a 5, or if they said the argument wasn't approved, they were asked to uh, justify the judgment. So a couple of the sample items. This is the one that I showed before, an adaptation of it. And this is an example of a valid proof that students saw. Here's an example of an invalid proof, and this was taken from Selden and Selden's JRME paper. So you can see that this is invalid because it's a if A then B, but it starts out by assuming B and proving A, which isn't the valid way to establish a theorem. They were also shown this. So this is a claim for a Goldbach's conjecture. I didn't write out the whole table, 
but I show that the um, Goldbach's conjecture is the sum of any even number greater than two is um, equal to uh, the sum of two primes. And I presented a table showing that it was true, as well as an argument supporting the table. It's actually open conjecture in mathematics then. Now, as for empirical evidence, uh, do students rely on appearance? Well, my study didn't find any support for that. So the empirical argument that I just shown, only one student said it was fully convincing. And um, on the other nine items that I've shown, at least 12 students were fully convinced by it. Only two participants thought the argument met the standards of proof. And again, that was by far the lowest. At least 11 thought the, argu the other <coughs> argument that showed met the standards of proof. And when asked why they said the argument was not convincing, 26 cited the limitations of empirical reasoning. Um, one of the things I was concerned about was, well, maybe they recognized this was an open conjecture. But no one made a response to this type. And uh, curiously, six of them actually said, well, I know this is true because I saw my professor prove this in class. <laughs> so, you know when you do these, uh, these qualitative studies, nothing surprises you. But by the time I was getting the third or fourth response to that type, you know, what's going on here? The, and one of the limitations of this study was I only used one, one proof, one empirical argument. And maybe they were thrown off by the table or something like that. But this finding has since been replicated by two other research teams. So I think it's pretty robust. If you look at the things that the student said, because I'm not convinced by argument, this argument is wrong. It's a terrible argument. And when I ask why not, he goes, you can't just make an assumption based on the first 26 numbers, not even 26 numbers. Another student, is, I like the way she worded this, I'm not convinced there's a lot more prime numbers than the ones that you presented. So it's not really a proof because it's a set that goes a lot larger than the one that they gave. So these responses suggest that students really weren't convinced by the empirical arguments. I also want to look, were they relying on the appearance of the deductive arguments that I gave? It might be the case that students do this, but I didn't find any evidence for this in the, in the study either. So all, the so all the participants judge at least one of the arguments to be approved, and 23 judge at least one to be a non proof So the majority of the students weren't simply saying everything that looks deductive is approved. There were only eight instances amongst the 196 collective deductive proofs that they read in which they even remarked on the appearance of the argument. In only one case did this alter a participant's judgment. And then, if you look at the ones that they said were invalid, in 41 of the cases, they cited a specific mathematical flaw of the argument. So it wasn't the case that people were looking at the argument saying, this just doesn't look right, it's not a proof. I didn't see, I saw very little evidence of that. About being a chance performance, well, the students were right <coughs> overall about 56% of the time, which is pretty bad considering they had about a 50-50 chance. <laughs> but it wasn't quite a random performance either. If I gave them a valid proof, they were usually right. They judged out to be right 90% of the time. If I gave them an invalid proof, they were usually wrong. But again, it wasn't the case that they were just saying all invalid arguments were proofs. Um, they were usually citing one or two that weren't. They were just missing an awful lot of them. The bit about understanding. So Selden and Selden said, in general, for these students, the students in their study, a feeling of understanding or not seemed to be an important criteria when making judgment about the correctness of the, the four proofs in their study. That also didn't seem to be the case here. If, so recall, I asked students on a scale of 1 to 5 where they understood the argument. There were 40 cases where they gave it a score of less than 5, but in the majority, they still said the proof is valid. There were only five cases where they said invalid, and even then, in three of them, they found they didn't understand the proof as a whole, but they found something that they believed was wrong. So it wasn't like they said, I don't understand it. This proof isn't there. The students didn't behave like the students in Selden and Selden sample. So what is going on? In my opinion, my best guess is that when students see an argument that tries to use deductive reasoning, their default judgment is that the proof is correct. And then they search the argument for an error. If they can't find one, they say the proof is correct. They're more saying, instead of saying the proof is valid, I see no reason to call it invalid. This is the reason they're always judging the valid arguments to be correct, in my opinion. It's hard to find a flaw if none exists, although sometimes students manage. The um, participant's search for error, however, is narrow. They're not considering all the things that they should. And in particular, they're not considering structural details of the proof, whether you're using a legitimate proof technique. 
This is the reason they're often missing the invalid arguments. But the arguments that they're searching for deal primarily with the mathematical content. So they're not rejecting the proof for subjective feelings of understanding or their appearance. If you'll humor me, I want to go on a two diversion. So the first is a point that, this is kind of heresy in math education, so I guess I don't like to give a talk if I don't make people a little bit mad. But there are some widely held assumptions in math education. And uh, the premise is that students hold empirical proof schemes, or convinced by example. The premise is mathematicians don't. And then the conclusion is we should try to create instructional environments to get students not to be convinced by empirical evidence, but to be convinced by deductive evidence. I would agree the conclusion would hold if I agreed with the premises. I actually think both premises are false. So regarding the, um, the empirical reasoning, I lay out the argument a little more in that paper. But it's not clear that students do hold empirical proof schemes. It's certainly not the case with math majors. I mean, I've showed three studies. I cited three studies, including my own, that showed this. One of my colleagues did a study where they collected proofs from math majors. And I think it was like less than 1% were empirical arguments. But the studies that have made the claim usually base the arguments, their claims, on the arguments that students produce. I give high school students some task. I want to see what proof they give. They prove by examples, so I assume they're convinced by examples. But it's not clear they are convinced. Uh, this might just be the best they could do. They might be trying to get partial credit. They might be trying to get partial conviction. And it's important uh, in a recent uh, article on epistemic cognition you have to consider the epistemic aims before you infer their epistemic beliefs. Shlomo Vinner also said it's a cognitive fallacy to infer too much from the uh, wrong work that students produce. This all sounds good in theory, but this actually bears out in some of the practice as well. So Eric Newton and his colleague gave uh, 400 middle school students six, six uh, uh, justification tasks. And they found that empirical arguments were present 36 to 81% of the time but you are far more likely to see an empirical argument for the harder tasks. Their explanation is students likely had no recourse but to use examples as their means of justification. Same with Healy and Hoyles. They did this massive study in the UK with 2,500 high school students. They gave them some justification tasks and found 34 and 43% of the students gave empirical responses. But they said, although empirical arguments predominate in students' own proof constructions, most students were aware of its limitations. Steely and Edies and Steely and Edies found the same thing with pre-service pre teachers. They'll give empirical arguments, but they know they're not completely satisfactory. So I wonder, the, I think the extent that we think everyone has empirical proof schemes is likely exaggerated. Uh, the other end, and this is more controversial, and um, this paper's not on the website yet, but if you email me, I, I lay out the case. I don't think it is the case that mathematicians never gain conviction from uh, empirical evidence. And in fact, um, philosophers in several empirical studies that we've uh, conducted suggest the opposite. So one case study that they do is Goldbach's conjecture. Most, most mathematicians are convinced Goldbach, Goldbach's conjecture is true based on empirical evidence. Not all, but most. And Echeverria, who did a review of this in 1996, claimed the certainty of mathematicians about Goldbach's conjecture is complete. I think that math, that math educators have a bit of a blind spot. They cert, math, mathematicians certainly don't prove by example. And if you equate proving and uh, convincing is synonymous, it would therefore follow that they're not convinced by empirical evidence. But proofs sometimes provide things that convincing arguments do not. I'll move on to more solid ground here. This is more for the beginning researchers, because uh, my inadequacies for running the first study would probably be obvious to the more experienced researchers in the room. What I wanted to do was find the, good stra the strategies that good students use to make sense of proofs and the strategies that bad students are using to make sense of proofs and design some instruction that way. And my study failed in that respect. But it failed for interesting reasons. Uh, one was I think I had a weak literature base, but the bottom two faults were mine. My methodology was inadequate. I would use verbal protocols for proof construction tasks, and they work great. With the uh, reading task, the students didn't give me much. So much of it was kind of subconscious or internal. They didn't say a lot, so I couldn't really infer much by the way of strategies. It wasn't that students were using bad strategies. It was more the absence of strategies, so I wasn't even able to get that. And I think I also had a weak theoretical backing of what it means to understand a proof. 
I tended to base the study largely on conviction, but conviction doesn't equal understanding. And also, you know, there's explanatory proofs. And I would ask the students, well, does this proof explain to you? Here, I'm making the mistake of trying to use a research or generated construct and try to see how the students felt about it. The students' responses were almost synonymous with convincing. This makes sense. I mean, if I went to a teacher, I'm like, well, how are you trying to negotiate this socio-mathematical norm? They look at me like they look at me like I had two heads. They probably wouldn't give me a very good response if they didn't know my jargon. But yet, I asked students if these proofs were explanatory, and not surprisingly, I didn't get all that much. Not surprisingly, in hindsight, I was a little disappointed in that after the results. So, in order to try to get a better theoretical basis, I wanted to tackle the issue of what it meant to understand. So, I think the issue of assessment is actually very important. Um, as I noted, there virtually is no meaningful assessment of proof of comprehension in mathematics, advanced math classes. And I think this is a mistake. Resnick and Resnick have a famous motto that you get what you assess and you do not get what you do not assess. I don't necessarily agree with the first part. I don't always get what I assess when I teach math. <laughs> but I think the uh, second part is true. I think also students, if you don't ask students, don't assess students on something, you're implicitly sending the message it's not all that important. I think that students want to understand a proof, they just don't know what it means. So if you don't give them assessments on understanding a proof, they, you know, you say understand the proof, they think they do understand the proof, or maybe they don't understand it all that well. And uh, this also provides teachers with crucial information. So you're trying to convey some insight to the class, it would be very useful for teachers if they knew whether this insight was actually conveyed. So my research group, as a starting point for the assessment, there was uh, what I thought was a nice paper on proof comprehension in geometry by Yang and Lin. Um, and their, their uh, model had four components. So it was the meaning of statements. So what did each of the statements mean? The epistemological status of the statement. So was the statement in a geometry proof an axiom assumption deducted, and so on. Logical chaining, which statements were justified by which statements and why. And what they call encapsulation, which is viewing the proof as a whole. Now, we like the model a lot. The encapsulation, they said encapsulation is not really that important for high school proofs. It's actually very important for college proofs, I think. So we had to flesh that out. But even the other ones, we had to flesh out a little. Most proofs in geometry are direct proofs. So but proofs in uh, the college level are sometimes indirect, the proof by cases. So you got to be a little, you got to flesh out a little bit more to worry about what, you know, why you're assuming the negation of the theorem. Is it a proof by contraposition and so on? But we basically adapted their methods for designing our own proof assessments for uh, college proofs. So the meaning of statements is relatively straightforward. The logical chaining or how each proof was justified, we would go forward and backwards, so why was, why was line five true? Or how did we use the, line, the claim in line two later in the proof? And then what proof technique is being used? So was the argument a direct proof and so on? We might also ask, why did the proof assume there were infinitely many triadic primes to start out? And that would be because you were in this famous proof of that type. You were trying to do a proof by contradiction and build a new prime that wasn't part of that finite list. The encapsulation piece was a little bit more um, dif uh, difficult. They just stuck it. They said, uh, this, isn't that, this is very important math. It's not important high school geometry. Our paper's about high school geometry. We're not going to touch it. We wanted to elaborate a little bit more on it. We didn't think that we had the liberty to duck it. And um, what I did was I interviewed some mathematicians about how and why they read proofs and how and why they taught proofs. Um, there's long papers on it that I could send you if you like. But the thing that I got was there were four reasons that came up in why they read proofs and why they presented proofs to students. So one is to try to get a summary of the proofs so you can get some type of um, coherent, succinct explanation of why something is true. One of the things that they stressed about proof understanding was how you could break the proof up into modules or independent subproofs. And they went on to say it's valuable because then you could see which assumptions were used in which module. One of the things is transferring the ideas of a proof to a different context. This is something that mathematicians actually do when they assess. So if you saw a proof that the square root of 2 is a rational, you might say, how would you prove the square root of 3 is irrational? But you go the other way. Why doesn't the idea transfer? Why can't you use it to show that the square root of 4 is irrational, for instance? 
And then finally, the uh, ideas of a proof are usually, for universal proofs, of course, a range. How do they apply to this specific example? This, if you read Carl Cowan's Ameri um, monthly paper, was the way that he predominantly checked whether students understood proofs. So, so the upshot of this is that gives me and other researchers a goal for proof presentation. So if I want to say students should be able to understand this, I could specify what this is. But more to the point, it gives me a method for seeing if these goals are actually being reached. And um, some other researchers have been using this to compare different types of ways for proof presentation or to evaluate the effectiveness of their interventions. Um, as of right now, it's uh, all a little bit loose, but we're trying to get psychometrically valid instruments that we can disseminate to mathematicians. And um, if you're interested, the bottom references uh, the paper about the model. And I want to go to the heart of the talk here. It's about beliefs and about strategies. So what do I mean by beliefs? Well, proving can be viewed as an interactional accomplishment, where I have some type of proof, and I'm trying to gain some conviction and understanding to the audience, and the audience receives the proof and obtains this. And the idea is that we both have to do a little bit of work for this to occur. It's well known that a proof can't contain every detail. They'd be impossibly long. And even if you did write one, it would be difficult to see the forest through the trees for the observer of the proof. And so we both bear some responsibility for this. If I was in a math lecture and I had a complicated proof, and I just skipped a bunch of steps and just wrote some symbols on the board and the students didn't understand, most reasonable observers would say, you didn't do a good enough job explaining the material. If I went and gave a proof and a student just wrote it down, never looked at it again, and then didn't understand the proof, they'd say, well, to the student, well, you need to work a little bit harder to get the understanding of the proof. And what I want to see is where the, um, whether the two agree on what the responsibilities of each party is. I'm not saying it's a right or wrong answer. I'm saying it's a problem if the two, don't dis if the two are at odds with each other. Now, a couple of interesting notes about mathematical practice. So, mathematicians certainly believe the presenter of a proof has a duty to do this. And the website that I have is a wonderful article by uh, Margaret Shen about um, how about a recent proof that was proposed. So, a Japanese mathematician. Let me read this. And I get this. Makazuki. I probably pronounced that wrong. He posted a 512-page document purporting to prove the ABC conjecture, which is a very important open conjecture in mathematics. And when mathematicians read this, they couldn't make heads or tails of it. And in fact, it's, if this was proven, this would be a landmark result. But mathematicians have simply given up on it. And the proof has so many new tools, relies on so many other unpublished results, that no one can make sense of it. And uh, the theme of the article is the mathematicians are actually really annoyed. So, and they're really annoyed because he's not following community standards. So part of it is submitting prior results for peer review. But what they're most annoyed about is after this came out, they've invited the guy to go do a series of lectures. He refuses. So the point is you have to give us something to go make sense of the proof. And because he's not giving them anything, they're like, all right, we give up. We're not going to read it. It's just relying in the ether. And the author had a nice quote uh, from that website saying, a proof in a vacuum is no proof at all. Now, on the other hand, mathematicians accept that the reader of the proof also bears a lot of responsibility. And typically, um, we expect uh, when they referee a proof, that's going to take over 80 hours of work to complete your review. The third point, and I think this is very interesting from my own studies on math practice, is there's actually quite a bit of variance in how much, how much work mathematicians expect to do in reading a proof. So I have a couple of studies that show this. So one is mathematicians seriously, all proofs have gaps, but they disagree about how big of a gap there is that renders the proof invalid. So we actually have a pretty tight study on that where we put the gap in, then they go, do you think this gap and this gap alone is enough to render the proof invalid? You get yes or no, you may get a pretty good split. Um, also, some mathematicians, when they're refereeing a paper, will check every line of the proof. Others say it's not my responsibility. These small details are the author's responsibility. So it's not exactly clear about how much detail is left to the reader, although we all agree that a lot is. We find something similar when it comes to teaching. 
So all mathematicians I interviewed say they expect the students to do a lot of work in understanding the proof. But how much work the students are expected to do seems to vary a lot from class to class. So in one of our, a neat study that we did, we found, we gave some mathematicians some qualitative tasks on like how would you improve this proof for the purposes of pedagogy. We noticed a lot added a particular inference in the proof. So we gave 110 mathematicians the original proof and the proof with the inferences added and highlighted in blue and said, do you think adding this makes the proof better or worse? We are expecting to say better because the other mathematicians did it and we want to say, aha, we've well, confirmed it. We got a, a dead split. I think it was 41 said better and 40 said worse and the rest said neutral. And if you looked at the reasons, the ones who said better, made the proof better is this could absolve some confusion, help the students follow it. The ones who said worse is like, this is really something students ought to be doing themselves. So it's not just that it's neutral, it actually made the proof worse. And we'll see some of that in the data I'm about to present. So what I wanted to do was find sources of disagreement. To generate the sources, I told you about the uh, proof validation study with the math majors. That's what I did before. And I also interviewed the mathematicians. I told you about that as well. And I wanted to try to find things that the students said that the mathematicians seemed to disagree with. After I did that, I uh, created a survey that I sent out to 175 math majors and 83 math professors, putting these beliefs kind of in stark contrast, seeing if I would get a split between the two of them. So just to highlight, to generate the hypotheses, I used the qualitative studies, and then essentially to test or verify the hypotheses, I used the, the survey. So I found four different beliefs. Uh, Students should fill in all, should students fill in all the logical details when they're reading a proof or should they be filled in for the students? What does it mean to understand the proof? How long should students spend reading it? And should students be asked to write diagrams of reading the proof? For the first one, I asked the 28 math majors after they did this 10 tasks, I gave them some open-ended questions like, so what do you think makes a good proof? And what they emphasize is you have to have every detail. Um, for me as a student, what else I would like to see is all the intermediate sort of steps, things that help me along, graphs, visual things. So th there were, I think, 16 of them who said this, that they really wanted everything spelled out. When I talked to a mathematician, one of them said he was talking about doing some wallpaper proofs with this graduate student. And so he said, this is one where he's deliberately not drawing pictures because he wants the reader to draw the pictures. And so I'm constantly writing in the margin and trying to get the student to adopt the same pattern. Um, pattern. Talks about doing an extra verification, writing lots of subproofs. So notice, not only did he say they had to do these things, he's saying that the author of the proof deliberately withheld the information because it would be better if he did do these things. So what we did, what I did, was I asked the students, I gave them two options. So the student had said, in a good proof, every step is spelled out for the reader. The reader should not be left wondering where the new step in the proof came from. Versus when reading a good proof, I expect that I ought to do some of the work to verify the steps in the proof myself. For mathematicians, this was worded slightly differently. It said, what would you rather your student believe? Um, the students, um, by and large, chose A. That in a good proof, every step is spelled out for the reader. And the, uh, the star there throughout these things is going to be a, a little cuts in one sampled signed rank test said that this was significantly different than neutral. And then mathematicians, 52% of them prefer B. I actually was surprised that this wasn't higher, but as I said, there is variance in the response. And the Mann-Whitney test showed that the response is significantly different. Another thing that I know, so when is a proof understood? If you ask, me, if you ask math majors, what are you trying to do? I'm like, I'm trying to read a proof until I understand it. Then when I asked the math majors to elaborate on that, it became clear that to most of them, understanding was understanding how each new step in the proof followed from previous understandings. So the bottom point, you have to be able to know the reason why each step was done and understand that it was a valid step. So this to them is understanding. However, for mathematicians, they would speak more globally, and this is how I generated the assessment model, when I said, if I can understand how each statement in a proof follows logically from previous statements, they understand the proof can, uh, completely. The large majority of undergraduates agreed. The large majority of mathematicians wished undergraduates would disagree. One of the things I noticed is that um, in my study, students spent 
under five minutes studying each proof, or even under two minutes, and this was even the case where they didn't feel they had a full understanding. Now, it could just be maybe they weren't that interested in the task and so on. This is what some pesky reviewers are giving me. But when I do um, proof construction studies, I can't stop them. Like after 10 minutes, I'm like, we gotta move on. No, I wanna, I wanna keep working on this. And um, if you ask mathematicians, one of their biggest complaints is students don't spend enough time studying the proof. So I said, when you present the proof, how long do you think students should spend studying it? Or for students, how long should you typically spend studying a proof that's presented to you in the class? And what I got, often what I got was a range of answers. I wasn't anticipating that. It was an open response, but they said 15 to 20 minutes. So what I did was I created a min and a max. So 15 would be the min, the max would be 20. If they just said 20, that would be the min and the max. Not all the participants gave me a response I could use. I would get something. Students, I would get things like, as long as it takes, exclamation point, which isn't, <laughs> it isn't that helpful. And embarrassingly for mathematicians, I would get like, what a ridiculous question. I have to answer that. But of the responses I did get, I did a t-test between the mins and the maxes with mathematicians saying the student should spend about twice as long as the students expect to spend. Really, this follows from the other two beliefs. If you believe every detail should be spelled out, and you believe understanding a proof is understanding all the details, not a lot, not a lot of reason to spend a lot of time studying the proof, then is it? Uh, the fourth one is about diagrams. So should all the diagrams be included? The majority of the students said yes. Mathematicians is actually a pretty good split. So I can't really make the claim that mathematicians think students should be drawing diagrams, although the plurality said so. What I can say is this, if about half the mathematicians teaching these courses are expecting students to draw some of these diagrams, and most students aren't, you are going to be getting a mismatch in at least some of the courses. I want to go ahead now and turn to proofing strategies. So what can students do to understand the proofs that I want them to get? So what do I mean by a proofing strategy? Well, I wanted to have three things. I wanted to have a theoretical reason for why the strategy is useful. I want the strategy to be indicative of mathematical reasoning through the eyes of a mathematician. And I operationalize that as the majority of mathematicians would agree that students should be doing this. On the other hand, I wanted strategies that students weren't currently doing. Not that that would make them in, invalid if students were doing it. It just wouldn't be very insightful. Like, well, I want students to be doing X. Students are already doing X. It wouldn't give me a lot of leverage to help students. And I also went about this with a mixed method study. So to try to generate the strategies, I used task-based interviews with a pair, with two pairs of strong students. I interviewed them with pairs to try to get much more dialogue back and forth so they're not just thinking to themselves like I did when I did the uh, earlier study with individuals. And what I did was I um, gave uh, two pairs of students who were known to be strong students and thoughtful students to talk with one another. I gave them the task to read till they understood it then I would give them the proof assessment items that I talked about earlier. And from there, I use an open coding scheme to generate strategies and provide theoretical reasons for why they were useful. After they did the strategies, I used, it was the, the same survey. I kind, of did, I kind of piggybacked one on the other. I would show 175 math majors, the strategy or the negation of the strategy. And I did the same thing for mathematicians. I wanted, so one of the strategies I had was that Good, the students, and this really seemed to help them, was to try to prove the theorem before reading its proof. So the strategy for students when, I, when reading a proof of a theorem, I usually try to think about how I might prove the, the theorem myself before reading its proof, whereas the contrast is I do not usually try to prove a theorem before reading its proof. And then just some kind of empty justification. The reason for reading a proof is to see why the theorem is true. For mathematicians, I offered a uh, change of slightly. I didn't want to say, I didn't want to compare students' practices with mathematicians' practices, rather students' practices with the desired student practices from mathematicians. So when reading a proof of a theorem, I would prefer if mathematics majors think about how they might prove the theorem themselves before reading this proof. Now, one threat to the validity here is, I'm not trying to get the professed beliefs, but their actions and um, students' reflections about what they do and self-report might not actually be indicative of what they do. And uh, indeed, Selden and Selden said, what students say about how they may prove seems to be a poor indicator of whether they can validate proofs reliably. They tend to talk a good line. However, the first reading judgment yield no better than chance results. 
But if so, this suggests that the survey will overestimate the effectiveness of the approving strategies because you have more students saying, yes, I do this, when they actually don't. So that it, nonetheless, it is a weakness of the study. It is possible that a lot of students are doing these strategies and aren't aware of them. So just to review, I use the interviews to generate strategies and provide theoretical rationales for why they're useful. Then I use the surveys to see if mathematicians want students to use the strategies and if students by their self-report weren't using the strategies. And I had five strategies. So as I said, to prove a theorem before reading its proof, attempt to logical structure, separate the proof into components of subproofs, consider examples for statements that are problematic, and compare the proof of the theorem to the approach that one would take themselves. So, the, so one of the striking findings is the students that I gave these proofs to usually would try to prove the theorem themselves before reading the proof. They weren't always successful. They usually weren't, but this had a lot of benefits for them. It motivated them to read the proof. They appreciate why the obvious approach wouldn't work. Uh, they skimmed the routine part of the proof that they were able to manage to focus on where the sophisticated ideas were. And also, by trying to prove it themselves, they were setting up the proof in a reasonable format. So they weren't like, trying to prove the converse or something like that. And when students were asked this, um, most of the students prefer option B. They do not usually tr try to prove a theorem before reading its proof, whereas the large majority of mathematicians would rather students do at home. The second and uh, third, I want to illustrate with a particular proof here. So the number of divisions of a positive integer n is odd if and only if q is a per if and only if uh, the number is a perfect square. So this is um, an if-then statement. So um, a if and only if b. That means you have to prove if a then b. Then you also have to prove if b then a. There's a couple ways you could prove something in the form if a then b. You could assume a and derive b. But you can also prove the contrapositive if a then b is the same logically as if not b then not a. So you can assume not b and then prove not a. And you can see the proof actually used it directly in the contrapositive here. And what I want to show you is how a couple of students approach this case. Uh, let's see. cooperating, but at least I have the students' written work I can show you. So the students, the most striking about that video, if you play it, I guess it's not that striking just seeing the picture, is that um, the students spent over a minute analyzing what P was, what Q was, how each of these proofs broke this up, and what was being shown. So they, wanted to, they actually labeled P uh, having an odd number of factors, not P having an even number of factors, and then showed how one was P implies Q and the other was not P implies not Q and why this was a valid proof technique. The other thing notable about this is they broke the proof into parts or subproofs. And both of these things were something that the students engaged in multiple times in the qualitative study. And so for the strategy too about attending to logical structure, when I read a proof, I first consider what is being assumed, what is being proven, and what proof techniques are being used, versus when I read a proof, I first consider how each new statement can be derived from previous statements. The uh, students, or much, um, well, 51% of the students chose B, but the majority of the mathematicians wanted students to choose A. So in the Selden and Selden and other studies where students would accept the proof of the converse of a statement, yeah, I mean, this is the reason why. They're not, it's not that they can't check. They're not even bothering to do so. About um, partitioning the proof into independent parts. So when I read a long proof, I try to break the proof into parts or sub uh, subparts. Versus when I read a proof, I do not try to break it into parts or subproofs. We try to understand how each new line follows the previous assertions. What we have is the um, students, the plurality, I think, here um, are saying statement B, that they don't do this where the large majority of mathematicians would prefer that they did break the proof into parts or subparts. 
I have two more. So considering specific examples of confusing statements, so if you're stuck within a proof, sometimes it's useful to illustrate the step that you're stuck with with a particular example. Students actually aren't so bad here. 43% of the students claim that they did so versus 34% who said they did not. And the majority of mathematicians wanted them to do so. And then the last one, this, was a, this one's a pretty neat one, I think, but comparing the proof technique used in the proof to one's own approach. So I'm going to show a clip. Well, in theory, I'm going to show a clip. <laughs> <laughs> but um, here's a particular proof that I gave. 4x cubed minus x to the fourth plus 2 sine x equals 30. So if you get, the way that you prove this is you could show the thing on the left has a maximum value of 20. It's actually less than 29, but it, you could show the maximum. Certainly can't be bigger than 29. So you do that. If the thing on the left can't get higher than 29, it certainly can't get 30, so there's no solution. The student's natural approach is to try to do some algebra, like isolate the sine x by itself. And if you think about it, that technique will quickly get you nowhere. And so after reading this proof, something interesting that I observed with the first proof that you looked at. So one of the things that you guys were doing, marveling at, was saying, oh, this technique is clever. This isn't the way that I would approach it. Uh, is that something that you do sometimes when you read a proof if you see a new technique? Yeah. Um, are there are any benefits to doing that? I noticed that something new? Yeah, using new techniques to solve proofs like that. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, aside from seeing my awkward skills as an interviewer, <laughs> um, if, you, if you give this to them, the 50%, only 26% of the math majors said this is something that they do, whereas 87% of mathematicians say this is something they want the students to do, and 2%, that's actually n equals 1. One guy disagreed with me. <laughs> I'm going to jump ahead since I'm running low on time here. So, what can we take away from this and how the situation occurs? Well, math educators often speak of a hidden curriculum where students learn undesirable behaviors based on patterns in the, that they observe in their teaching. This isn't, when I say learn, this isn't anything that we actually want them to teach. It's something that they learn more from our regularities. So the classic <laughs> example that Schoenfeld gives is if you give students 20 homework problems a night, you're pretty much telling them that it shouldn't take you more than five minutes to solve a problem you have to be sadistic to give them 100 minutes worth of homework a night. Um, I think that classroom presentations in class might encourage these beliefs. So students are rarely assessed, signifying a lack of importance. Proofs are usually presented quickly. Now there's a reason for this, because the mathematicians have so much curriculum they have to cover, and um, they expect the students to go and study the proofs when they go home. So none of these, any of the things I'm saying, I'm not saying are directly bad teaching practices, it's that students might be taking the wrong message. If a proof is presented in 10 minutes, that's telling students you can understand a proof in 10 minutes. And the emphasis on proof is typically on correctness. So when the mathematicians go over a proof and they re-summarize it, I notice that they go over why each step follows logically, rather than the themes that could generalize, such as giving a summary or proving other things. And this might suggest to students that understanding a proof is about correctness as well. Mm. A 
about the beliefs. So how might students acquire these beliefs? Well, how are proofs introduced in high school geometry? At least in the United States, predominantly by a two-column framework, where the uh, left, uh, left side, or sorry, uh, yeah, the left side contains the statements. The right side says the specific rule of inference that's there. There are no gaps in a two-column proof in geometry. And this format has been known to show, to show students value and form over substance. We have similar things in the proofs that we give in introductory to the proof courses, where we ask students to justify even the most obvious statements from axioms. Again, saying everything has to be justified. And it seems to me that the students then can, uh, can hold professors accountable to the same standard. Now, there seems to me that there's an epistemological difference between the proofs that we expect to hand in, that, that we expect students to hand in to us, and the proofs that we give to students. The student proofs that we present to students aren't about correctness, and they're not about showing students that we're good at proofs. They presumably assume that. They're about conveying some information and insight. The proofs that students are expected to hand in are supposed to show us that they understand what proving is, we use this as a window to assess their knowledge. And we're not, a, we're not hoping to read the students' proofs from the grade and that we're going to find a new way of thinking about a mathematical concept. It happens occasionally, but that's not what we're doing when we grade the proofs. Now, the result here is for the student-generated proofs, more detail is better. I get a better sense that they know what a proof is. And the more detail they provide provides me with more insight into what they're understanding. With the proofs that I present to students, more detail is neutral to worse. If you focus too much on the logical details, they're not seeing the higher level ideas. So this, to the students, the student-generated proofs, the mathematician-generated proofs, they probably don't see an epistemological difference between the two, in part because they're both using the word proof and the difference is never discussed with them. But from that, you can certainly understand how they can develop the beliefs that they have. All right, and uh, thank you. Um, we have time for like maybe one or two questions if anyone has any questions. All right, well, thank you. No one, really? Okay. Oh, oh, oh okay. go ahead. Oh, Kevin. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Keith, I'm curious at your thoughts on what role content knowledge plays in some of the practices that you see that they do, because what struck me obviously being a trigonometry guy was their comment on, oh, trigonometric fun functions, that makes things so different, right? So I was wondering what your thoughts are on what that sort of phenomenon implications are for their group reading and group comprehension. Uh, this is, no, it's a good question. I certainly don't want to say content knowledge and you know, proof isn't important. Uh, with the example that they gave there, what I think that the uh, students realized was with the sine of x, their approach to solving the problem, the natural approach of using algebra. When you show that proof to other students, so you know, the less successful students, they get annoyed. They're like, why are you using calculus? Why are you making the proof hard when you can use algebra? So they kind of get annoyed that you're kind of introducing a new, more complicated technique when an easier one was there. These students in the video that you saw were perceptive enough to realize why their approach would fail. That's one of the reasons in our teaching experiments when we ask students to do that and then to compare it to their own approach, we have like a lot of light bulb moments when they go, oh, that's why that doesn't work and that's why this works. But you need to draw the students' um, attention toward that. In terms of the content knowledge in general, can you be more specific about the question? Because I'm probably going to answer something that's not quite getting what you want. Uh, so I'm sitting there thinking, you know, their content knowledge in that case of trig functions is going to obviously influence maybe the proof technique that they might take at that problem, right? You know, what they, because on that case, envision just the domain and range of the, or the range, really, of the trig function is going to influence their ability to draw off that proof. So if they, so the resources that they have. Yeah, I'm wondering the what the, you know, I know it's not necessarily your entire focus, but what you've seen relative implications for their proof practices on, you know, their content knowledge relative to the resources they can draw that might, how that might direct the students to different uh, techniques. So in terms of, well, in terms of proof construction, this is kind of a harder issue, like what resources you have to, to bring to bear on the problem. In terms of um, proof reading about the conceptual resources, 
what I would argue is that when you read a proof and you didn't quite have this awareness, one of the values of proof in this situation is that it can expand the ways that you think about the math concepts. So when I interviewed mathematicians, one of the, there are two reasons, primary reasons why they write proofs. The most common is so they can find ideas to work on their own problems. And I felt very validated because that's how I read math ed papers. I'm like, oh, that's a good citation. Ooh, that's a clever way of doing it. I tend not to care about the results. It's entirely, <laughs> entirely a selfish, mercenary way of doing it. I'm like, oh, cool, mathematicians are selfish and mercenary too, so I guess I'm okay. <laughs> But the other thing, this is by far the most common. If you ask mathematicians in a survey, which I did, I don't check proofs for correctness. I just look for my own ideas or something like that. He had 70% or something agreeing with it, and not many disagreeing. But the other thing that they do is they say, they describe this as, um, you know, you have mental models associated with the concepts, which, is, which suggest proof techniques and things that are true. When they read the proofs, they say they do it to try to go back and capture the author's mental models. So they want to, ex so they, one of the guys had a beautiful quote where he said something like, you know, I see that and I see the technique that he did. And it's all kind of, you kind of can see how the proof is going to go if it works, but what made him think that this would even be true? Like, I'm not going to go and spend weeks doing these techniques only to discover that the, the result doesn't work. He said, I would try to go back from the, what the author was thinking or through his lectures and try to see what made him think that this was true. So the so one of the goals of this proof is to kind of think about psi in terms of its range and stuff, or to think about proving or disproving equalities using calculus and maximum and minimum values is something that we would expect students to get out of the proof. So the, in short, the proof, the way I would look at it is that if you didn't have the conceptual knowledge that you're describing, the proof is one tool that you can use to expand it. Yes? Uh, your, your proof strategies are, uh, I was kind of wondering how you uh, arrived at these strategies. I mean, do you uh, actually watch the students uh, read groups and how they prefer the strategies that they use for the process that they're reading them? Or do you kind of, uh, you know, operate a little bit different uh, way? way you know? I, mean, I, I didn't see you, you know, talking about the, how you actually construct these strategies. Oh, okay, so it's a, a methodological question. Yes, so uh, what I did with them, um, when we take the students, we had them talking to each other while they read six proofs. And what I would do is watch the, um, in real time, if I noticed that they did something, I would take a note. And there were two, se there were two sessions, uh, three proofs in each session. And I would take a note and then ask the students, I noticed that you did blah, is this accurate, and is this something that you do often when you read a proof? they said yes, I would try to ask them why. Then, all, but after we had the videotape, I had a, my doctoral student and I independently would watch the tape and anything that wasn't just directly reading the statement, we would note and use an open coding scheme as a strategy and then go and compare our approach. And if we were lucky enough that the strategy occurred after the first session, I could ask students about it in the second session. If it was in the second session, then I couldn't ask the students about it, but that was how I would infer it. I tried to infer it from what they said to each other while they were talking about the proof. Yeah, but I'm, I'm wondering if, uh, if you have a number of these strategies, or you have three or four strategies that, that you have strategies out of it. How does that work? Well, I, one of the things that I've been doing, and I didn't have time to discuss this, is teaching experiments where I would try to teach ordinary students to apply these strategies and see if that helped them understand the proof better. And one of the nice things about the teaching experiment is actually it was useful for um, refining these strategies. So one of the things that if I just go and say to students, I want you to try to prove this theorem before reading its proof, what, they'll, what many will do is say something superficial. So I'll say, ah, proof by induction, or whatever. Then I found that I had to give sub-questions to really get them thinking about it. Like, if, what do you think this proof would look like, and what difficulties do you expect to encounter? If you give students practice answering those questions, they actually can get pretty good at it. And then when they see the new technique, they think it's, they can pick it up and think it's clever, and then extrapolate it to other circumstances. So that was one of the things about the, uh, 
the proof strategy is if you just ask students to use them, they often don't even have the content knowledge to use them, or they might use them in a way that they're thinking of the strategies rather than through my eyes. So I'm not sure if that's answering your question, but we developed the strategies in this way. We have a taxonomy of about 10 of them. And then we um, refine the strategies via our teaching experiments. In some cases, we find out that the strategies that we had actually weren't very good. They were good in the study. Mathematicians said they liked them. And then they didn't really buy the students anything. I didn't talk about them here. I didn't want to talk about my dad work. <laughs> <laughs> I, could give, I could give one example that we said to try to describe the theorem that is going to be proved in your own words. And uh, this was something that the students in the study did, and the mathematicians kind of liked. They only give it to them, and like one of them has proved that E is irrational, and the students get annoyed, like in my own words, irrational is E, what do you want, what do you want me to say? <laughs> and it turns out that describing it in their own words, it didn't really buy them anything, because if they could do it, they understood the statement. If not, they would just give a very bad description of it. So like, no, this isn't really what we want our students spending their time doing. Our, oh, go ahead. Is it going to be a short question? Sure. Um, so you asked mathematicians how they wanted their students to look at a proof, and um, you said that most of them wanted to think about assumptions, uh, what they were going to prove, and the strategies involved, right? I think you have that up there. Um, yeah, so what I, what I did actually uh, was I asked them general questions, but I tried to make it, I made it specific. So I gave them the proof that the square root of 2 is irrational. And I gave them the proof that a bounded monotonic, uh, a monotonic bounded sequence was converging, which is a well-known theorem in real analysis. And I don't remember the exact questions I asked. I remember there were five, and one was, what would you, why would you present this proof to the students? What would you hope that they would learn for it? What would they need to do to get this understanding? Uh, things like that. I don't remember the exact question. I did the interviews like four years ago. <laughs> but it was, it was things like that. And then I would ask them the general questions. One weakness of the study is, I mean, the responses that I got were probably re very related to those two proofs, right? But um, I think what I'm getting is real things I wanted to, want them to do. I just can't make any claims that I have a comprehensive list. It's possible if I ask them that I'm some theorem of group theory or something that was more like discrete that you would get a different type of uh, different type of proofreading strategies. Does that answer your question? Well, I actually had a follow-up question, okay. which was, did you ask them as well how they presented the proof? What I did ask, well, I didn't ask that question, but one question I did ask was, there anything that you would do, add to this proof or change to the proof to make it more comprehensible to the students? Okay. And um, I, I got to be honest, I can't remember what the answers, what the answers were. I, I, I have a paper where I think I wrote it out, but my memory is failing me now. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much. And thank you all for coming.